I'm Chris Preston. And I'm Brad Simmerman. And welcome to Street Check, the best podcast in the 50 plus year history of Kevin Wealth Network. Uh, we have lots to get to today. Um, so uh, we're going to f- bypass our usual uh, defend the take. Um, we're going to leap right into our big three. Uh, Brad, tell people what uh, we're going to talk about and then who our guest is. We be- we will begin with the market hitting new all-time highs on Wednesday, yesterday. If this comes out today, which I suspect it will, we're uh, recording a little bit early. Then we're going to talk all things NVIDIA, upcoming stock split, uh, the biggest top signal I've ever seen, usurping Apple at number two, uh, largest company by market cap. And then we're going to talk about Mexico, the Mexican stock market sell-off, pace of weakness, what happened there. And then we'll be joined with Tom Hutchinson of Cabot Dividend Investor and Cabot Income Advisor, and we're going to talk dividends and dividend stocks. And if we have time, we'll we'll talk NBA Finals, which is a big deal here in New England uh, this year, at least. Um, okay, let's. Uh, so yeah, def- no defend the tag. It was supposed to be your turn, Brad. So you're off the hook, uh, which um, I'm sure is a relief to you. Uh, but number one, the big three uh, market is at all time highs. Remember how negative we but. Usually I'm Mr. Positive. Uh, I'm the optimist on this on this podcast, but I was we went through would we pick 10 stocks to buy, sell, hold yeah. for the next year, stocks and sectors. And I was <laughs> I had more sells than the actual fever buys than you. I was like, man, maybe I'm getting bearish. Well, things have changed in a week, less than a week. Um, and the market is at all-time highs. Uh Ru- the Russell 2000, as you noted, um which is small cap index uh, was up one and a half percent yesterday. Um, and that's something that's really been lagging as, as I discussed with Tyler London on here a few weeks ago, uh, showing that it's not just, you know, we'll get to NVIDIA. It's, it's a big part of it. Uh, not just NVIDIA and other mag seven and AI stocks seems like, you know, other, other uh, sectors and, um pieces of the market are, are joining the rally um but again it's just one week um seems like we've kind of been alternating every week for the last few weeks you know markets at all time highs everything's fine and then you know a week later is the, are we in for a longer correction and hey the market actually hasn't budged in 2 months well now it is at all time highs you know barely um what's your take on the latest sort of uh move in this schizophrenic market? I think we've hit a little bit of a tipping point uh, insofar as Bank of Canada cut rates yesterday, European Central Bank cut rates today. The Fed is on the docket to probably cut rates in September. I mean, maybe we get a surprise cut in July. I wouldn't bet on it, but no. I don't know. It's sort of a wild card. Um, but if rates are coming down and all the cash that's been sitting in well, cash, high yielding cash specifically, Mm -hmm. is still on the sidelines. Um, The big money has to make a choice, right? It's either we suffer reduced returns or we increase equity exposure, um, you know, if we don't see a crash coming or if we don't see a recession coming. So I I think we're at that point. Um, Earlier in May, we saw a lot of we saw what looked like a lot of institutional selling, just regular selling throughout the day stocks coming down hitting a bottom like midday and then and then buying up into the close which looks a lot like repositioning to me yesterday when we hit all time highs i didn't see that at all it looked like it was just net buyers out there yeah so you know my my bull thesis would be we're not going to see more selling and more profit taking as a means of changing exposure. If there's going to be shifts in exposure, we're going to see cash coming off the sidelines and being invested. Um, The yields have been declining. 10-year yield dropped like 9% in the last week. Um, As you you noted, IWM was up 1.5%. That's a risk-on measure. So, you know, we talked six months ago about the rally needing to broaden out, and maybe we're there or at least maybe we're reassessing whether that's going to happen. Uh, plus the biggest stock in the in the index or the second biggest stock in the index hitting new all-time highs and going up 6% will tend to juice broad index returns. 
Right. Well, yeah, let's get let's get to NVIDIA. Um, NVIDIA is at new all time highs, just keeps rising. It's now uh, the second most valuable public company in the world. Uh, it's over three or right around three trillion dollars. I think it might have dipped just below it uh, after rising above it. Um, just behind Microsoft is past Apple and it's just behind Microsoft for the most valuable public company in the world. Um, that alone is enough to wonder like, hey, wonder if <laughs> NVIDIA might be at a top. Now they're going to do a stock split, 10 for one stock split to make it more accessible accessible to retail investors, I guess. Um, uh, officially with tomorrow, but goes in effect on Monday or won't be tradable till Monday. Is that right? Yeah. And I, I don't know that that's going to really move the needle much, especially at all-time highs already. But you saw a more, uh, I don't know, sinister or under the radar side sign of a top for NVIDIA. Explain what that was. There, there was a, a photo that circulated online yesterday. I doubt anybody listening to this has has probably come across it, but maybe it's hit all the broad all the news wires now. Uh, CEO Jensen Huang signing a woman's chest at a semiconductor tech. I don't know if it's semiconductor specifically, but at a tech conference. Yep. Rockstar CEOs. I mean, like we've talked a lot about Elon Musk. Um, he seems like the most likely CEO that that I can think of that would do something like that. But that level of celebrity for a CEO strikes me as a major, major top signal. Um, I mean, you can't you can't trade off it, right? What do you like? Okay, some guy signed a woman's chest, but the fact that it happens um, is a, is a very exuberant sign to me, to say the yeah. least. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, a lot of times it is sort of the um, the more anecdotal uh, signs that are the more reliable signs of a top, right? Like, I know I remember Tim Lutz, when he, you know, he used to run Cabot for years, say like, well, you know, when you're, and this is a dated reference now, when your cab driver is asking you about stocks, it's time to sell. Uh, when, you know, every single person you run into all they want to talk about is the market. You know, we saw this early 2021 when memes, the meme stock craze back then. Um, that's all anyone could talk about. Meme stocks, Bitcoin, uh, NFTs. I couldn't even think of it yep. first. NFTs. Remember, I mean, NFTs were a big one, but you know, it was not so much the assets themselves doing what they were doing. Although, you know, NFTs and meme stocks were pretty crazy. Uh, but just the fact that everyone you knew at the time was talking, wanting to talk stocks, Bitcoin, NFTs. Um, and this is sort of a, a microcosm or the a much smaller version of that, even with, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world. Yeah. Something similar happened in the run up to the housing crash around the, um, the sort of great recession where there were store, you know, plenty of stories of people getting in cabs and having their cab driver talk about his investment house that he had and right. like the same kind of thing. Um, there's a quote and I don't know who to attribute it to is something along the lines of if the shoe shine boy is asking you about a stock, there's right. nobody left to sell it to even, I, even like, more dated reference. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but I like, yes, anecdotal, but the, the, the fundamental aspect of it is once everybody is aware of it and everybody is buying it, there's nobody left to buy. There's nobody left to drive pi prices higher. Um, yeah, I'm. I you know I'm sitting here. I'm trying to think of like what the next, what the next major catalyst for Nvidia is, and the only thing I can think of is people that already have a lot of exposure increasing their exposure. Yeah, um, we all own it. If you own, if you have a four hundred one k, you own some amount of it. If you have exposure to the S and P five hundred, you, you know five percent of that exposure is Nvidia. Uh, so you know, let's say three or 4% of everybody's invested assets on the planet, or at least in the US is yeah. in NVIDIA already. Um, unless somebody sees something that I don't and says, okay, well, we need to double down and go from, you know, a 10% holding in whatever growth fund to a 20% holding. I don't know who's left to to buy it. Now, right. I think I've, I'm perpetually in the 
NVIDIA is a little bit overbought here, Camp. Uh, you know, you and I were both holds last week, right? Were we yeah. holds? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah. if you if you own some, I would not care. I I think NVIDIA three, five years, ten years, eh, probably less, maybe a year, uh, will be higher than it is today. But I do think it's in for some. Uh, a bit of a yeah, comeuppance is probably too strong, but um, I think at the very best, it'll be uh, choppy, um, you know, for the coming months. Um, yeah, know. calling calling tops and bottoms is, although it's something we do on the podcast, that is a fool's errand. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you're in NVIDIA, you don't sell it now as it's no. hitting new all-time highs. No. You let it ride and, uh, you know if when you get up to so, sort of those like high profile events like earnings stuff like that if you're worried about it take some shares off the table right yeah if you're worried about it now sell covered calls on it now and you maybe miss out on upside like there's things that you can do to to manage your portfolio exposure without just having to run to cash the one thing that i will say that you know going back to our conversation about the market at new all-time highs we're not seeing people running for the exits right now. Um, the fear is always that if you do, that the exits are going to be crowded and you'll be the last one out. But we're not really seeing a ton of signs of that. I still I still am advocating just smart portfolio management to reduce your overall risk, not not wholesale run to the exits. Yeah, and, and one last thing on NVIDIA. So we mentioned the two companies that's it, that it's, in company with, uh, it's in the rarefied era of around three trillion um, market cap. Apple and Microsoft. Every American knows the names Apple and Microsoft and what they do. Nvidia, I, I don't think so. I wonder what the percentage of the population that knows a what Nvidia is, and it's probably high, but I doubt it's you know, it's not a hundred percent like Apple and Microsoft. And B knows what exactly what they do. Um, you know, I, I so I think that right there tells you that it might be a little bit out over its skis. It's a term we've used a lot lately, but um, you know, yeah, but it's also right. It's also you know at the forefront of a huge uh, you know the the AI movement. It's at the forefront. There's no denying that. But uh, that's not it's not something that's built up over decades like Apple and right. Microsoft, um, and and been in people's houses. Uh, well, I guess it has been, but it hasn't had the product recognition that those two have had for decades. Yeah, I'll bet twice as many people know what the stock is versus know what the company does. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I've mentioned before, when I was in high school, I used to build PCs for myself, and it was always AMD graphics cards or Plot NVIDIA graphics and cards. Let's keep going. Yeah, do everything. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and you know, for a long time, AMD was was the better graphics card manufacturer it's nvidia lives or dies based on the ai thing if if ai is transformative and it it's in everything there's there's a world in which every single server on the planet has some like nvidia gpu that's running this little sort of small self-contained large language model that's delivering like ai services um that's not my expectation for it i i i continue to think that we are at peak hype for AI as a, not, not even AI as a technology, large language model driven AI as a technology seems to be at peak hype. And now we need to see if it monetizes. And if it does, NVIDIA becomes the most valuable company on the planet. Um, yeah. If it doesn't, I don't know what NVIDIA is worth at that point. Right. Um, okay. Let's move on. Uh, number three in our big three, uh, Mexico just had its held its, uh, presidential election and elected a new president's first uh, female uh, president, uh, Claudia Scheinbaum. Am I pronouncing yep. that right? Um, and, and its stocks sold off uh, to the tune of about 10% in a matter of days, but it's recouped. It's already recouped uh, most of those losses. Um, I, I, takeaways, I don't, I guess does she... The concern with her being elected is that she's maybe a little bit less business friendly uh, than her predecessor. Um, but is this just similar to what we saw when Trump was first elected in 2016? Now, he wasn't accused of being um, 
business unfriendly, but he was an unknown, just like she is an unknown. And remember futures tanked overnight, but like they bounced back by the end of the, his first day after being elected, they were up and then continue to go up. Are we seeing something, you know, this took a little longer here. Are we see something similar where it's just the, regardless of country, a, a, a typical post-election um, overreaction, uh, especially when there's an unknown candidate who was just elected? It certainly seems like it. The The fear, as I understand it, is, and it's, it's kind of something we talked about when we were talking about the election year cycle, is that they have enough power now in the government that they have the, the the ruling party so to speak will will be able to enact constitutional reforms right uh, their entire government is aligned politically in one direction so you can you can implement sweeping changes in a way that if you've got opposing party control of branches of government you just can't do that adds an uncertainty um i think a lot of big investors were net long mexico because they've had such such strong economic growth with the near shoring push from the US, you know, Mexico, I think uh, took the number two spot for our, our trading partners, uh, maybe earlier this year, but manufacturing activity has been been solid there. Uh, so it's very much a, a fear response. And I think that's why we've seen the bounce back that we have. She, Scheinbaum has, has sort of promised to continue her predecessors economic policies so friendly with the US continuing to uh, build on our manufacturing relationship that we have I don't really see a material difference between the incoming administration and and the predecessor it seems honestly like an overreaction and probably business as usual yeah um, but I, I don't I won't pretend to know you know, much about the policies, her policies versus the, you know, previous yeah. regime's policies there. I, you know, I don't know a whole lot about Mexican politics. What I know is, you know, I think Mexico is a fairly intriguing place to invest uh, because, as you mentioned, it's, you know, it's prominence as a trade partner. And because I think as Carl Delfeld, our, our global investing expert, has cited when we had him on here a, a while back, um, how cheap manufacturing is there and why companies want to go there. That's why companies want to go there. And, you know, he's had some one or two stocks in his portfolio in the past year, Mexican stocks in his portfolio because of that. Um, Mexican stock market is up. Um, EWW, which is the ETF that tracks it, is up 44% in the last five years. You know, not too bad. Um, I don't think a new president changes that narrative or trajectory at all. So, you know, I would say you could buy the dip, but I think the dip is already <laughs> already yeah. passed. So uh, I guess this doesn't really move the needle much for me in either direction. I think Mexico's still, you know, a fairly intriguing overseas or you know outside U.S. borders play, um, and it, it was a week ago, and it still is now. Yeah, yeah, I think you're spot on. the The dip has been bought, so the the quick profit potential seems to seems to be gone. And now you're just banking on an economy that I think is has a two point nine percent annual GDP growth rate over the last few years. So relatively strong economy that has an incentive to continue providing inexpensive manufacturing. I mean, that's that's a concern is that if you start implementing wage increases and stuff like that, that maybe some of the bloom comes off that rose, but it's been such a driver for the Mexican GDP that I can't imagine whatever the political inclinations are that you're going to uh, slay the golden goose, so to speak. So I, I don't think it's a big needle mover. I think the quick profits are gone, but and I, I also don't think it makes it a, a bad position to be in uh, Mexico in general. That is no. Okay. Uh, let's uh, bring in our guest for today. Uh, and that is Tom Hutchinson, chief analyst of Cabot Dividend Investor and Cabot Income Advisor. We will welcome in Tom in just a minute. And we welcome in Tom Hutchinson, uh, chief analyst of Cabot Dividend Investor and Cabot Income Advisor. Uh, Tom, thanks for joining us. Um, we realize we, we haven't talked dividends a whole lot uh, on this program recently. Um, and you your performance has been really solid. You've outperformed the market this year at a time when dividend stocks in general have been, I guess, kind of so-so, at least if you go by the, what, the SDY, uh, you know, they haven't been bad, but been a little bit 
you know, maybe a little bit more like the Dow, um, sort of underperforming the S&P and, um, and the NASDAQ. What, I, I know that you have sort of, you struck gold with uh, some tech stocks that I won't mention uh, their names on here, but um, where, where do you see dividend stocks now? Are you still sort of, is tech sort of, you know, a place you're leaning still, or are you shifting gears and looking elsewhere now? No, I'm definitely still leaning toward tech, but dividend stocks are pretty, it's a pretty diverse thing. Yeah. And, and when dividends, you see dividend stocks kind of lagging, that could be most of them. And it's kind of been in the defensive dividend sectors. Mm -hmm. But in areas of technology, obviously, um, healthcare, uh, specialty rates, uh, energy, they've been doing very well. Yep. Now, one question that I wanted to ask, and I, I think probably getting this out of the way up top is is a smart move. Um, dividend stocks versus funds. My takeaway from having read a lot of your <laughs> a lot a lot of your your writing is that uh, um, you are probably a bigger advocate of buying individual names versus relying on the performance of funds. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I am because. <clears throat> I've been doing this for decades and decades. Um, if I were, you know, sort of an inactive investor that just wanted some exposure, a fund would make sense. But I have the hubris to think I can pick individual mm -hmm. stocks that will outperform. And you mentioned the sectors that have outperformed this year, uh, tech, uh, energy, I can't remember, uh, you said one or two others. Healthcare. Healthcare, healthcare, yeah. Um, so is that kind of, you st stick in with those as sort of a, you know, striking while the iron is hot. Cause I know you've mentioned healthcare is sort of a, an evergreen dividend sector because the aging of the population is a thing that's exactly. not affected by the fed or inflation or recession or anything. Um, that's sort of your evergreen one, but sort of like, you know, in energy oil prices have dropped off a bit, but is that, do you think that's, uh, are you sort of bullish on that just on the premise that you know, oil prices are, are likely to spike, especially as we head into summer. Well, yeah. Um, as long as we can stay away from a recession. Yeah. I think they'll be okay. And it's a nice hedge for any escalation in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, but also what's doing very well this year are utilities. It's actually the second best performing sector on the S&P 500 right. outside of technology. Uh, and the reason is they just got so cheap and they've been so neglected and hated for so long that they had good yields and uh, recession resistance um, and investors have been coming back. So that's probably more timely. It has momentum uh, that in technology uh, right now where the momentum is. I like as evergreen sort of with uh all the artificial intelligence craze and boom. I obviously like technology. I don't think that's going away. And healthcare, like you said, because of the aging of the population. And I like to fall back on those because I don't really know what's going to happen. I mean, who knows? Um, but it doesn't really matter. The population's still going to age. Companies are still going to invest in the new technology as to not be left behind. Um, so you're kind of uh, immune uh, to market preferences in the intermediate term. It seems like we're at reaching a point now, and I know people have been calling for it for for a long, long time. And you you have not weighed in specifically on on trying to predict the future, uh, but it seems like we're getting to a point where the Fed is going to have to cut rates. Uh, you know. One of the things that I have posited to Chris is that we are potentially in an environment where regardless of what inflation looks like to the downside, uh, or I'm sorry, regardless of what inflation looks like, the downside risk recession is going to prompt rate cuts. Um, the upside risk inflation seems to be cooling. Are you largely getting into the rate cut camp? Are you repositioning at all based on 
what you're seeing for the Fed, or are you just steady yeah, Eddie? No, I'm, looking... I'm out of the rate cut camp. I'm <laughs> an enemy of rate cut campers. I, I don't believe it. I mean, look, um, inflation is still too high, 3.4%. Uh, now, that may sound like nothing. They would have killed for that in the 70s, but it's not measured the same way. No. Using the old measurements, probably closer to 8%. And this is after rates rose to near 20 year highs. So it's problematic still. And the economy, at least so far, is pretty strong. The projections for second quarter growth are what I've heard in the twos. So as long as that's the case, um, you know, inflation is hanging around and annoying with rates this high. I don't think the Fed's going to want to risk lowering rates. And having inflation hang around for the rest of the decade, especially since it's partially their own fault. I think was that was it Tyler that was on uh, Chris with you when I was out that was in the same same boat saying yeah. no rate cuts from the Fed. Yeah, th he that was more just a prediction for him. He said no cuts this year, which I first I'd heard. I guess so. You're that's what you said. You thought they should do. What do you think they'll do for the end of the year? I don't think they'll cut rates unless things materially change. Okay. If third quarter growth is 0.3%, that'll change the story. Right. Yeah. Um, but aside from that, I don't think they're going to cut the rates. And yeah, but I, I on here have been, we thought it was so, semi crazy at the beginning of the year, or I guess heading into this year. And, you know, some people were expecting six rate cuts. Who was it that, that predicted that? Was that Goldman Sachs? can't remember. Right. J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan. Six rate cuts starting in March. And we never thought, I think Jacob, you know, Jacob Mintz, our options trader, all were like, that, there's no way. And, you know, while I didn't necessarily think it was going to be pushed back to September, which is, seems to be what people are thinking now, uh, the amount of rate cuts that were predicted seemed crazy to me. And it seems like that's why, part of why some of the air got let out of the balloon in the market in April and I like guess second half of May is just people coming to the realization like, oh, they're not cutting as fast as or as early as we all thought. Yeah, absolutely not. And there's, there's another motivation that um, people might not be aware of. Inflation has a long history of being notoriously a pain to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And you have to err on the side of fighting it. Now, right now, there's no erring going on at all. But even if that comes up there they're much less likely to cut for that reason. And, you know, the Fed doesn't want to be brought up in, you know, business school classes as, you know, <laughs> what not to do and how to react to that, you know? Right. Uh, so I think they're pretty motivated to keep them here. And like I said, unless things materially change, they're not going to cut them. And I think the market has to come to terms with the fact that rates are unlikely to go down or go down with any significance without economic pain. Is that changing your outlook on, on your positioning at all? I, I mean, I know you've been in this camp uh, uh, for a while now, I think, but it, it, have you changed or, or are you eyeing some point in the future where it's like, all right, well, I'm, I'm going to have to start repositioning the portfolio. I'm going to look for something where I think there's maybe a missed opportunity or where the market is mispricing those risks. Yeah. And I think we just had that in the utility sector. Uh, and as we tango on, I think sort of sideways, likely for most of the summer, I, I think you'll see opportunities uh, in other areas. Uh, but the most recent one has been, utilities and the, and the more conservative dividend stocks, which have come alive again in a pretty big way. Um, so that's, that's what I've been eyeing recently as an opportunity of mispricing. You, one of the beauties of dividend stocks um, is, you know, not, not just the dividends themselves having, you know, certain amount reinvested if you're reinvesting, uh, reinvested into the share price quarterly, but the companies that are able to pay those dividends are companies with a lot of cash and companies that sort of stand the test of the time. And what's always stood out to me is um, you at our uh, our Cabot conference, subscriber conference a couple of years ago, um, put up a slide during your presentation of 
five stocks, five dividend stocks, if you had invested $10,000 in each, uh, what they would have returned over 10 years. And every single one of them, uh, at least more than doubled, uh, all but one tripled um, it, with the dividends reinvested. And they're all household names, Home Depot, Pepsi, McDonald's, Visa, Eli Lilly. And is this, with dividend investing, is it sort of less complicated than just, you know, playing the hot trend if you're purely a growth investor? You just, so like, what are the good, what are the good companies that pay dividends consistently, grow dividends consistently? Buy those, they'll probably do well the next 10 years. Well, yeah, uh, the dividends I like for two reasons. One is the dividend. Yep. And historically, it's accounted for a lot of market returns. It's the only, only thing paying you when the market's not moving higher. But really, it's a great way to screen companies. Do they have reliable enough revenues and earnings to continue to pay the dividend and raise it? Uh, you'd have to have a good niche, a solid business plan, and, and walk the walk. Uh, so it's a great screening mechanism. You know, Chris, that reminds me of, of one thing that I've, I've read in the past. Coca-Cola, Buffett bought, you know, 50 years ago, however long ago, um, and is now at a point where annually he's getting or maybe every two years, he's getting about 100% of his purchase price back. So maybe we're all just overthinking it. And it's as simple as Tom says, the companies that think they're strong enough to to pay out dividends to shareholders are probably the strongest companies. The dividends are going to pay you if the market moves sideways, or even if it moves lower. And if you invest over a long enough time horizon, that's all you need. It, there, there's a lot of truth to that. And I think you win in the division, in the uh, dividend realm by not losing big. And if you get invest in good companies that have paid reliable dividends, that's highly unlikely. And over time, the dividends continue to roll in. Uh, they come back in favor and they continue to move higher. And if you hold it long term, like I, I think I bought Lily uh, myself 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And um, my yield at cost is like 15%, even though it's only paying like a 0.6% yield yeah. of you share. Right. Now, do you have any steps? So you just said um, the thing that you need to avoid is losing big. Do you, do you ever have like position sizing uh, steps that you take where it's like, all right, well, I've had, XYZ stock for 15 years, it's now 20% of my portfolio. I'm going to start paring this down. What do you look for as a signal that it maybe is time to reduce your exposure or do you even worry about that? Yeah, that's that's complicated because there's no exact answer. I don't apply yeah. one formula to it. Um, yeah, if you want to balance the portfolio and it becomes too big a part of the portfolio, it definitely makes sense to just pare down a little bit um and you know you have to look at what the fortunes are going forward and the price um and all that or it's kind of, maybe it's going to go out of favor for the next year and a host of reasons you might cut it loose or pare down the position yeah. uh, in my most successful positions i've i've pared them down just because they got so high priced right and do you do like I know in our growth advisory is my, you know, Mike Centola has sort of a quick hook. He'll do 15% uh, loss limit in bear market, 20% in a bull market. Do you have like a hard and fast loss limit with your stocks or, or because their timeline is, they have a sort of a longer timeline. Do you, do you let them, do you give them a little bit longer leash? I'll give them a little bit of a longer leash because most of uh, most of the stocks I buy, I've been at it for a long time. I have followed them for a while and I kind of know their behavior and what's a red flag and what isn't. Um, if anything's down 10 or 15 percent, I'm going to watch it pretty closely. Yeah. And unless there's a good explanation for it, uh, I'm probably going to cut it loose. But there usually is. And, sector's gone out of favor the selling's been overdone yeah we were talking about seeing that with 
the Mexican stock market just the other day, right? Like drops 10% essentially on no good reason and quick rebound. Um, and as you said, if you're screening for high quality, if you're using dividends to screen for high quality companies, your sort of catastrophic downside risk is very, very limited. So it's all going to be sentiment risk that you're experiencing, um, especially if you're looking at a long term or e even maybe an intermediate term time horizon. Yeah. I mean, unless the story is materially changed, which sometimes it does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tom, thanks for, for joining us today. And again, um, if you want to read more from Tom or subscribe to either of his newsletters, I highly recommend it. Uh, Cabot Dividend Investor and Cabot Income Advisor. They're similar, but Cabot Income Advisor has a covered call portfolio, um, which is uh, almost 100% winners, I think, from what I've seen. But yeah, I mean, I've, um, you know, just anecdotally, you know, I've, I'm editor in chief of Cabot, so I see, uh, everything that comes in and people, the marketing team will ask me, you know, what's doing well, what's doing well. And during the bull or bear market, 2022, early 2023, it was almost uh, every single week. I'd be like, well, we could go with Tom stuff because that's hanging in there. And I guess that's, well, A, you're really good at this and been doing this a long time, but B, that's sort of dividends are resilient there. You've outperformed this year in a, in a bull market and they sort of hang in there and do just fine in a bear market. And I guess that's the, my way of sort of promoting your, your newsletters there, but there's cabotwealth.com. Uh, you can find them under premium advisories, cabot dividend investor, cabot income advisor. I recommend either of them. Uh, Tom, thanks again for joining us. And thank you all for listening uh, to this edition of street check.